the telephone, the Speaker of the House. Roger Hanshaw. Roger, good morning, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. Am I going to be interviewed by the Honorable Mike Hornby today? Oh, you're going to get grilled today, Roger. Well, I am in the presence of greatness. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Now, I'm you, done here. You, uh, that's a good day right there. That's your promo. Yeah. Uh, Roger, let's, uh, let's talk first and foremost about this, uh, the governor's veto of the money that was supposed to head to WVU. I, about two months ago, I saw this uh, wonderful feature about the neurologist at WVU who chose to come to West Virginia to do his work, and he's doing groundbreaking work in neurology, helping to solve problems like Alzheimer's and addiction through the work that he does. You were uh, trying to target $2 million to go to the, uh, uh, the, the hospital there for furthering of this uh, research. Any idea why the governor vetoed the money? Yeah, we spoke about that on Friday afternoon uh, after the letter was released, Rob. So that that, that project is still moving on 100% full steam ahead apace. So uh, if you actually read that bill that was vetoed, it directed money to the governor's civil contingency fund, which is a pot of money that we sometimes work with the governor to collaboratively direct to various projects. That fund has in it right now enough money for that project to nevertheless still be funded and it, it's going to be funded so the team at the rockefeller neuroscience institute is still moving full steam ahead with a clinical trial beginning in april for ptsd and neurology based obesity it's it's a it's an incredible astonishing development that the team there in morgantown has done i i wish every west virginian could tour that facility meet dr resign see the kind of, of of work that they're doing there i i'm telling you now the man's going to win the nobel prize someday it's amazing stuff that he's doing you, you could probably catch it in the 60 minutes archives and, and such but it blew me away when i watched what he was doing. So was the veto more of a technical veto because the cash didn't actually need to go there? It was. Uh, it, it was. That wasn't necessarily clear from the letter, but when we've spoken to them, uh, they'll, they'll, we'll, we'll reorganize all of the money that needs to go in the various places where it needs to go uh, when we convene again in May. But as far as, the, as the, the research program, the clinical trial at the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute is concerned, it, it's moving on full steam ahead, and we're happy that it is. Was the $2 million a specific amount that was needed for a particular part of this research, or was it just general it was. funds? That, it was. That, that $2 million was a very particular number. So the FDA actually administer, or, or governs these kinds of clinical trials. And Dr. Rezai and his team at RNI had received FDA approval to launch that clinical trial, and the, the amount of capital required to deploy the technology was, was a very specific $2 million. So that, that, that was a very particular number, and we, we turns out to have it on hand and available to be deployed in a different way. So we're moving, we're moving on. So, Roger, did the, uh, the Senate added another $4 million to, the, to that bill. Would, that, would those monies still be uh, used for the different uh, universities or uh, projects at WVU? My understanding, Mike, is that that money was was not specified. It was a just a, a kind of more general award of four million dollars without specificity, and that perhaps that may have been what the governor wanted additional detail on. Uh, as, as you recall, that that didn't come from the house; that came from from our colleagues elsewhere in the building. And perhaps the governor's office wanted more detail on that. I wasn't involved in any part of that particular part of the bill. And, uh, well, and that wasn't, sure that wasn't the reason we ran that bill. It was We ran this bill just for the Alzheimer's research or the that's PTSD. That's correct. And as long, as long as we can move forward with the clinical trial yep. that is time-sensitive, then uh, I think we're good to go. The additional funding, to the best of my knowledge, is not time-sensitive, and we can make that available when we convene in May. But the time-sensitive piece of this funding is uh, available and ready to roll. Mr. Hornby, obviously, in a year's difference, is much more comfortable in his role uh, as a delegate because last year at this time, Roger, he would have never talked over you while you were still talking. <laughs> I would not have talked to him last year. <laughs> Actually, you know, we, I was talking to Roger uh, about this. Uh, when I first met him, uh, first week of session last year, um, I went to him to have him you know, sign on to one of my bills, and I thought I was talking to – I thought, you know um, – one of these rock stars. I was shaking and sweaty, and then I found myself this year sitting on his desk, yelling at him about something and making fun of him. And uh, may have gotten a little too comfortable too fast. 
I, I'm not that scary, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see about that, Rog. I don't know. Hey, hey Horn, Hornby was at the podium. Hornby, Hornby chaired the house for a part of, of a day. I saw the picture. Yeah. yeah, there was a lot of signs to vacate the chair from the, from the, the members, but <laughs> I, had a lot, I had a lot of fun. I got a lot of friends there, so we had a lot of fun. And I think you did uh, – I think that was a really – cool thing that you did this year was allow members to chair every day and do introductions it's so different uh looking out as opposed to looking in mm -hmm. it, it really does put it into perspective uh, roger let's uh talk about this clawback provision and do you have any more knowledge of it since the legislative session ended uh, we do we've gotten we've gotten verbal confirmation now that we are all clear we're awaiting the the written letter from the US Department of Education but uh, we we've been verbally we've been verbally told by the the federal government the U, the US Department of Education that the work that we've done over the course of the past couple of years in terms of funding additional teacher pay raise service personnel pay raises putting teachers aides in classrooms and some of the other investments that we've made that will that will dramatically exceed the 465 million dollars at issue is more than sufficient for the federal government's purpose purposes and that we're all good to go. Does that news affect the May interims? Will they still need to be a special session to address budget issues or is that now? There will. Ability? There will. We left that. We left a substantial amount of money unappropriated this year specifically to, to make certain that we were all clear on that issue when now we are. So the question becomes, do we want to do any one-time spending on things like infrastructure projects on one-time capital investments for for expenditures in 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 and across state government that uh, that don't grow our overall base budget but nevertheless need to be done so we'll we'll when we convene in may we'll be doing all those things we'll we'll also likely be revisiting some of the things that we did this year in the budget process out of necessity just to deal with the uh, the impending uh, threat of a return of money so we'll we'll be looking at all those things when we re when we reconvene are you at this time confident in the state's revenues going forward? I am. We have a we have a budget surplus projection this year of of, of uh, again a nine digit sum of money. Uh, I I recall very vividly when I was first elected to the House going into a nine digit deficit. So uh, my very first year in the House, instead of trying to figure out where to spend $500 million, we had to figure out how to cut $500 million out of the state budget. And I don't ever want to be in that position again. I, I don't ever want to be in the House again, and I hope I, I hope Delegate Hornby's never in the House again in an environment in which we have to we have to take a hatchet to that amount of, of services in state government. Uh, right right now, our projections are strong. We have a number of economic development investments that have been made in West Virginia over the course of the past five years that aren't even online yet. So some of the largest investments that we have we have ever made as a state in terms of recruiting and attracting new employers to West Virginia are only just beginning to come online. So we haven't realized any of the benefit from those investments yet. So we'll start to do so over the course of the next 24 or 36 months. So I feel good about where we are. I think we've made some prudent decisions. That that doesn't mean that we can that we can rest on our laurels, Rob. We've got to still be good stewards of the people's money, and we've always got to be looking for ways to find efficiency wherever we can find it. But at the moment, I feel good about where we are. Matt Miller. Speaker Hanshaw, I, I, I'm just sitting here kind of amazed at at how you explained the money that was spent in education that now gives you the all clear on the four hundred and sixty five million dollars was that callback because someone from the federal government side was not aware of all of these expenditures that would have covered that did it just become a matter of you needing to make them aware of what you had spent money on yeah it was the latter it, it was the latter so the and, and let's be very very clear about about how we got in that situation. No one no one is alleged or asserted or even implied to have done anything wrong. Okay, I want to make that very very clear here. Sometimes the the reporting and coverage of that situation over the course of the past few weeks has suggested that maybe someone did something wrong. I want to I want to dispel that right now because I was I was in the room when some of those conversations were being had about the amount of federal money flowing into West Virginia over that period of time, and we had something like nine sets of rules for how that money could be spent in 11 weeks. 
Uh, that that may not be exact, but but it's close. And it was it was it was impossible. I, I, I stand by that adjective, impossible, for anyone to keep up with what the requirements were for how money that was flowing into county boards of education, county commissions, even the state coffers, was to be spent. Sometimes rules were being issued post hoc. So money would flow into into a community, it would be spent, and then the federal government would reissue rules dictating how that money could be spent. So no, no, I, I, I lay blame at the feet of no one here, other than perhaps the federal government for printing a trillion dollars. But that's that's another that's another conversation for a different day. What what we have here and what we had here was a situation in which the state of West Virginia made substantial investments in public education along the lines that we've just discussed. And what we did, what our executive branch did on our behalf, and they did it well, was make the case to the federal government, look, we may not have complied by the black letter of the law with the rules that you promulgated in nine different sets of rules over 11 weeks, but we nevertheless spent huge amounts of money and will be spending huge amounts of money on public education. And if that's what you sent us the money to do, then we've complied. And they agreed. Michael or John? Go ahead, John. Well, what I what I want to ask was, and I, I think it's great. I know they went after a lot of states on this because everyone was confused. It wasn't just it wasn't just us because of the the mess the federal government created with all that money and all the changes. I just want to ask about the the session that just concluded. Was there anything that you felt was was really top of the line that should have gone through that you guys weren't able to get through, negotiate with the Senate, and get toward the uh, governor's desk? Oh, there's always things that 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 uh, remain undone, and we'll we'll always we'll always have a few things left undone. Uh, we had a, we had a very good student discipline bill this year that got uh, that got caught up on the last night of the session this year that we we certainly want to get back to and revisit. We we want to be sure that we've we've appropriately empowered classroom teachers. That was a priority of uh, of many of us this year. We we want to be sure we get back to that. Uh, we we always we always need to be making sure we're we're looking not necessarily taking action but looking at where we are tax wise. Uh, you asked earlier in the the interview here today, Rob, about what my projections were, what my level of confidence is in the revenue for the state going forward. That's a conversation that needs to be had every day at every level of government, especially by those in our executive branch who are who are on the pulse of it every day. Uh, do do we need to in any way? Look at how we have structured the income tax reduction triggers. I think we'll be looking at that in May this year when we reconvene, because one of the things that we have noted is that that perhaps we need to trigger one year out as opposed to trigger a mid-year uh, trigger in the middle of a budget year, which which can complicate finalizing a state budget that's one of the things we're going to be looking at in may that's that's very far down in the weeds that's a, that's a really technical issue but it nevertheless becomes important when we start to write a state budget uh, we we did take an action this year that will bolster and solidify the long-term viability of uh, the state's unemployment compensation trust fund we're still going to be taking um, some additional looks at that just to make sure that what we've done is 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 the right thing to do there there's 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 always going to be things that need done it's uh much much of what the legislature does the public would find mind numbingly boring because it's not the headline grabbing partisan uh, controversial issues it's just the nuts and bolts of running the government you know at at its core the government's effectively a business and a lot of what business owners do every day isn't exciting it's just the things you have to do to pay the bills Michael? So, Roger, kind of looking forward, same line of questioning. Um, through your lead leadership, the House and the Senate has had uh, many successes over the last six, seven years. Um, and we've really, I think, brought the state forward. But looking forward, what are some of the goals for the next few years under your leadership? Well, Mike, for me, and I've made no secret about this, I talk about it often, I'm in the legislature for purposes of trying to create a more diversified economy. Uh, I, I, I have long believed and continue to still believe that the way we solve most of the societal ills that we face as a state 
and the way we address many of the problems that most of us as as conservative citizens of West Virginia perceive to exist in our state is by giving people very good jobs, the best possible job we can, giving them enough money in their family's pocket to make decisions for themselves and then getting the government out of the way. And I continue to believe that. So for me, my, my unifying, almost singular priority in serving as a member of our body is creating a diversified economy. You know, I, I come from right smack dab in the middle of West Virginia, and it's, it's not – Rob, I think I've said on this show before, it's not uncommon for me to go weeks at a time without ever crossing the border of the state, you know, I, I, that weeks at a time. You guys cross the border three or four times a day mm-hmm. and never think twice about it. Uh, that's that's just the difference in where we live. But as a consequence of that difference, our economies are quite different. So I, I come from a part of West Virginia where the extractive industries were working for three generations. And as a consequence, when when those industries began to slide and began to move out of West Virginia, the, the economic stagnation that's followed that has been dire. And we're still facing the the results of that right now. So creating a a more not just a, not just a larger but a more diversified economy is my number one priority. It's it's the number one thing that I spend time worrying about as a legislator. How do how do I take steps to create not just more jobs but different kinds of jobs so that we aren't ever again subject to the boom and bust cycle that comes with putting all of our economic eggs in a single basket. When you have some of the smaller, rural, poor counties that West Virginia has, is it feasible to expect that you could move a uh, new company into one of those counties and they need a labor force of three or 400 or 1,000 people and expect that people would then move to that county to get those jobs? Or is it just not feasible that a company of that size would come to a county like that in West Virginia? Well, our number one resource, Robin, the number one challenge we have in in so many of our counties of West Virginia is actually land. It actually turns out to be a a developable site, and uh, that that um, that that's not something that's intuitively obvious as you drive through Martinsburg, right? You you have the you, you uh, I'm going to go so far as to say the word luxury. And that may not be, you, you may not perceive it as, as a luxury, but coming from the, the more mountainous part of our state, and I know Delegate Hornby and some others took a bit of a tour down to even the more mountainous part of our state uh, during the legislative session this year, 50 flat acres of developable land is a rarity in many, if not most, parts of West Virginia. So where we can site a facility and where we can recruit an employer to locate in West Virginia is driven as much by physical features of the geography as it is by any other singular factor. And our economic development professionals who work in the executive branch every day will will tell you that's true. So, Speaker Hanshaw, is that the kind of reason for the the push that's needed in our better internet services and things like that because those are the types of businesses I mean as long as you've got an opportunity to be online you can work remotely from anywhere in the world so is that uh, more of a push to make sure that we've got those types of services to every part of West Virginia? Oh, 100%. Could, couldn't have said it better myself. We, we have 1.8 million West Virginians. There, there are 1.8 million of us. That's smaller than many of the suburbs of Houston. That's, that's smaller than, than each of the five boroughs of New York. That's smaller than, than the downtown area of Chicago. If we're going to talk about diversifying the economy and growing the economic opportunities for West Virginians, we have to realize that that comes from taking advantage of customers outside the borders of our state and we have to be sure we're connected to those potential customers we aren't going to be able to grow ourselves into the kind of economy we want just by looking inward we have to be outward facing speaker roger hanshaw our guest here on the program did you have a question mike well, i just had a comment i think uh, roger's absolutely right I, I went down south with a couple of other delegates and uh I didn't really understand why we were called the Mountain State until I went down there. I mean, it, it literally was a river, mm-hmm. house, road, railway, and a cliff of a mountain. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. Uh, it's nothing like the topography of, of up here in the Eastern Panhandle. Oh, absolutely not. Not even close. We've yeah. I know Matt were sports and myself, too, mm-hmm. when we were younger. We've crisscrossed this state many times, yeah. and you start – Driving up a mountain, and maybe 15 minutes later, you're at the top, and about 15 minutes later, you're at the bottom, and you're going 70 all the way down that mountain 
if you're not speeding. Uh, Roger, I want to ask you about uh, DHS. Uh, I've done several interviews on the split of uh, DHHR, and I've gotten a couple different responses. One, it's too soon to get all the information in to find out what the efficiencies and inefficiencies are. And two, uh, those three places, all they're doing is trying to bloat themselves to become bigger than the one we split up when you had all three back together again. Is there truth to either of those? Uh, there may well be truth to both of those, Rob. So the p part of part of our job as as the legislators is making sure that we're asking the appropriate questions of the appropriate people as this process unfolds. So I do think we've got a lot yet to learn. So it was the largest entity of state government before the split, and with that with that split, it's going to come some some uh, some separation pains, if you will. And there's a lot of work that's that's still yet to be done in realizing what kind of efficiency we can gain there. And realize when, I, when we talk about efficiency here, we're not necessarily just talking about economic efficiency. So for many of us, we, we talk about efficiency in government, and that's that we, we use that term as a proxy for financial savings. And while that's true, and while we always want to, to wring every dollar of financial efficiency we can out of state government to best utilize our taxpayer resources. Operational efficiency matters just as much to us, specifically when we talk about some of the most vulnerable populations in the state, particularly the, the, the young people we have in foster care around the state of West Virginia. Operational efficiency matters just as much to us here as economic efficiency. So while, while we do have to keep our, our, our thumb on the scale, so to speak, and make sure that we aren't allowing uh, allowing financial bloat to happen, we we nevertheless have to make sure that we aren't um, we aren't ignoring the operational efficiency piece. And while this is going on, is there any progress for these kids who are in the system right now, Roger, in West Virginia? Uh, so yeah, the, the answer is yes. That that organization is led by one of our our former colleagues and a uh, gentleman on whom we have have implicit trust, Commissioner Jeffrey Pack. Uh, he he's he's doing tremendous work there. It is, it is a thankless job, and it is a job that literally keeps him up many nights. He reports to us often, both when we're in session and out of session, about the progress being made there. It, it's it's a slow it's a slow slog, and we're going to be we're going to be at it for quite some time. But we are we are doing good work there. Final minute. Uh, anything that you want our listeners to know about this 60-day session that went by, Raj? Well, for, for the, 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 the takeaway that I want everyone to know is that we ended the calendar year 2023 still $400 million above our revenue estimates, which means that for the first half of the fiscal year, we, we closed out the books still $400 million ahead of revenue projections. We're, we're doing a very good job, and we're, we're proud of the job that we have done of being good stewards of the people's resources. Now we have some we have some investments to make in one-time expenditures coming up in May, but for for the most part, I, I want people to know that the men and women that you've sent to Charleston to make decisions on your behalf are being good stewards of the people's resources. Mr. Speaker, thank you so much for your time this morning. Much appreciated. My pleasure, gentlemen. Have a great day. Speaker of the House, Roger Hanshaw.